Warning, this film contains content that some viewers might find distressing. Viewer discretion is advised. At noon, bodies were still being hauled from the mass. It was impossible to say that the things taken from the burning wreckage were human beings. Greetings and welcome to Frozen Time. I'm Catherine of Skye and here we relate moments in history that shape the people around them, events which are often dark, disturbing, and tragic. So if that's what you're into, you're in the right place. Please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, it's time to cozy in for a tale that you won't soon forget. Context. In 1918, the First World War was still raging onward. On the 15th of January, the keel of the first purpose-designed aircraft carrier was laid down in Britain for the HMS Hermes. Also in January of that year, the Spanish flu, what we now know as influenza, was first observed in Haskell County, Kansas, and would sweep the nation and later the world, causing between 17 and 50 million deaths. Gabriel Fauré published his fantasy and Gustav Holst his very serious work, The Planets. The night before. The performers of the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus were finally resting. They had packed up the circus trains the day before, putting their working animals on and then carefully packing all of the tents, sideshow props and tight wires and tent stakes, the unicycles, the carnival prizes, the costumes and every other piece of bric-a-brac that belongs in a circus grounds onto the first train, which then headed out. Mamie Ward was one of those people. She was a trapeze artist, a member of the prestigious Flying Wards, who delighted audiences with their aerial acrobatics. The performers, roustabouts, and other circus workers, very tired from the day's work, climbed up the stairs into the cars of the second train, feet plodding, but anxious and thankful for a comfortable place to rest. They had sleeping cars as well as standard passenger cars to rest their weary muscles. Also, check out these super sexy turn-of-the-century outfits. <laughs> also, apologies to our podcast viewers who are unable to see the picture I'm looking at, but you can check it out on the YouTube version of this program. I don't know what's going on with these outfits. Their hats almost look like, like baby doll hats or something like that, and the... Um, yeah, the bodysuit is kind of uh, interesting. Definitely worth checking out. So come to our YouTube channel and look at this picture. Anyway, circuses rarely had the latest and greatest, but they felt at home in the old wooden train cars. They were lit with the soft, warm glow of oil lamps, adding to the comforting feeling of their resting place. The Hagenbeck Wallace Circus was one of the larger outfits of the day, employing around 400 performers and roustabouts. Most of the performers were slumbering in the sleeper cars located in the back of the train, far from the smoke and noise of the chuffing engine. They finally pulled into their destination in the pre-dawn darkness, waiting until the repair shed opened up. There was a mechanical problem that needed to be fixed on some of the passenger cars, so they were being moved to a spur in Hammond, Indiana. The rest of the cars had been left on the main line. That break in the continuity of the train would turn out to be a blessing. We begin our story in the early morning hours of the 22nd of June, 1918, all the way over in Michigan. Alonzo Sargent was a train engineer, and he was already having a hard day, even though it was early, early morning. The previous day, he was up at 5 a.m. and had had no sleep since then. Yes, that's right, no sleep in the past 24 hours, and he's heading off to work again. The drive ahead of him would be very long indeed, and he knew he wouldn't be able to eat again until the next morning. He decided to chow down on a couple of heavy meals to try and replenish his strength, taking his kidney pills to keep his health up. He boarded a troop train composed of 20 empty Pullman cars and got into the cab of the engine a K80R462 Pacific steam locomotive, number 8485, stealing himself for the long journey ahead. He opened the windows in the cab to get some cool air. He left Kalamazoo, Michigan, hauling the 150-ton train, and followed a freight train to Michigan City, where he replenished the water needed for his steam locomotive. 
He stopped a couple more times on account of the train ahead of him stopping. After Michigan City, the track ahead was clear. As he went along the route, however, he saw some warning signals, but the blocks ahead of him cleared, so it wasn't necessary to come to a full stop. He arrived in Gary, Indiana, and slowed down to comply with the city regulations, and he saw no more warnings for a while. He went along his way, going about 25 miles an hour, that's 40 kilometers an hour, when he saw another warning signal, but he didn't reduce speed because he expected it would clear before he got to it, or he would see the danger in time to stop. Okay, the KOS has to interrupt here and remind the audience, train signals are there for a reason. If they are red or indicating a warning, it means the track ahead has a train inside the block. It isn't lying to you, I promise. For God's sake, stop! At this point, Alonzo noticed that the wind was blowing very hard inside his cab, so he reached over to close the window, which instantly made the cab more comfortable. Unfortunately, it was too comfortable. What with the heavy meals in his stomach, spiking his tryptophan and serotonin levels, and the gentle rocking motion of the train. It was a veritable rockabye cradle, and Alonzo dozed off in the heat of the cab and missed the next two automatic signals, as well as the warnings posted by a brakeman of the 26-car circus train, which had made an emergency stop to check a hotbox on one of the flat cars. He was only 75 feet or 23 meters away when he awoke suddenly and immediately grabbed the brake handle to put it into the emergency position. Allowing himself to fall asleep even for a few minutes or seconds proved to be a fatal mistake, although he personally was spared the cruel scythe of death. At around 4.05 a.m., Sergeant's train plowed into the caboose and four rear wooden sleeping cars of the circus train near a rail crossing known as Ivanhoe Interlocking, which is five miles or eight kilometers east of downtown Hammond, Indiana, at an estimated speed of 35 miles an hour. That's 56 kilometers an hour. On impact, the oil lamps in the circus train ignited the wooden cars and the fire quickly spread. The Ivanhoe signal tower was about 100 feet, or 30 meters, from the accident, and the two men who were stationed there heard the awful crash, the shattering of wood on steel, the whooshing burst of flame that shot up into the sky and started burning the rest of the cars. They saw people being thrown from the train and others trapped under pieces of mangled and splintered wood and steel. Immediately, they phoned multiple agencies to rouse help for the victims. The crash was so loud, a neighbor was woken from his sleep and said he thought the local steel mills had blown up. Strangely enough, the first on the scene was the mayor of nearby Gary, Indiana, who brought the fire chief. He then phoned all the medical personnel he could. Michigan Central Station performed the triage for all the victims, and they were then sent on to St. Margaret's Hospital. Alonzo Sargent stayed there for an hour or more, assisting in getting people out of the wreckage, sorrowfully laboring under his own horrific mistake. Mamie Ward was jolted out of her deep sleep. Instantly, she felt like she was a contortionist, her body bent at very unnatural angles. Her mattress had folded tightly and completely back. Painfully, she found her feet were clear above her head and she was unable to move. She heard someone ask in a rough voice, You all right? Mamie answered that she was okay and then added, but I can't move. Alexander Todd's was the voice she heard and with some serious wriggling, she was able to work her way out into the car's aisle. Soon after, Todd also got himself free. The floor was a spike pit of jagged splinters, although they didn't notice them at the time. The roof of the car had slid down, crushing the upper berth onto them. Mamie then heard a voice coming from above them saying, Give me your hand, I'll pull you up. It was Charlie Rooney, one of the bareback riders. As he pulled her up, her long braided hair caught on splinters of wood. I didn't know you were so heavy, Rooney joked, and then harshly jerked her up. Her hair was partially ripped from her scalp, and she screamed in pain, even as she was grateful for the rescue. In the dim dawning light, she could only make out utter chaos. Theirs was a the fourth car from the end, where were the other cars? The ground was a jumble of steel and smoke, and in the distance, an ominous red glow that was beginning to crackle like a bonfire. A shock of pain struck Mamie, and she looked down at her feet. 
Every toe had been dislocated. No two pointed in the same direction. Todd pushed her toward safety. Get up that way, he gestured with urgency, and take care of yourself. He disappeared into the smoke, ignoring the glass that slashed his bare feet. He was looking for his wife in the berth opposite theirs. He soon found her and ambled out of the debris, her limp, dead body in his arms. The Tortuous Inferno Mamie was one of the lucky few who survived in those cars. The train worker in the caboose, however, was never found. The caboose had been completely crushed, smashed, and ground into the back of the other wrecked wagons. And this brings us back to the quote that we started the program with. At noon, bodies were still being hauled from the mass. It was impossible to say that the things taken from the burning wreckage were human beings. The Indianapolis Star. Most of those who were killed in the train wreck died in the first 35 seconds after the collision. Then the wreckage caught on fire. Confused and bleeding survivors stumbled and lurched from the wreckage. Joe Coyle, the head of a celebrated clowning family, was in his mid-30s. He survived the train crash with minor injuries. His wife Stella and sons Howard, 9, and Joe Jr., 2, the youngest child being billed as, quote, the youngest clown in the United States, were with him on the train. Joe was thrown free of the wreckage in the crash. His wife and children also survived the impact, but were pinned beneath debris. Some victims survived the impact only to be trapped by the heavy debris as the flames approached. They begged the stymied rescuers to shoot them, to be spared the agony of burning to death, according to press reports. But there were no mercy killings. Okay, so this sounds absolutely horrible to me. These are really brave people. They literally defy death on a daily basis, working with wild animals, doing crazy stunts with fire, walking tight ropes, and doing other dangerous activities, and yet they're begging to be put out of their misery swiftly rather than burned to death. And remember, this is open air. They're not going to pass out due to smoke inhalation. They are going to die by flames. And as they do so, every nerve in their skin is going to feel excruciating pain, which is just, it's just so hard to imagine being in that position. I think it's impossible unless you've actually been in a fire and been severely burnt. The Star reported the rescuers, quote, were compelled to stand by helpless and hysterical as they listened to the agonized screams of human beings slowly burned to death. Joe Coyle did not stand by helpless, but instead, quote, in spite of his injuries, labored hysterically to extricate his wife and children until he was dragged away by rescuers, said a wire service report published in the Belvedere Daily Republican the day after the crash. As the trapped coils burned to death, Joe Coyle lay on a stretcher, wept bitterly, and said, I wish I could have died with them. They literally burned to death before his eyes. Rumor and Investigation Since the war was still raging on, some people thought the train wreck might have been the work of German saboteurs, but of course we know that's not true. The rumor mill went berserk. People claimed that wild lions and tigers had escaped and were roaming the backyards of Gary, Indiana. Elephants, in a heroic attempt to put out the flames, died while spraying water on the burning wreckage with their trunks. None of these stories were true. If you remember the very beginning of this film, I mentioned that the animals had been transported aboard a completely separate train that left before the passenger train and was nowhere near the crash when it happened. It had arrived safely at its destination. The wreck is described in great detail in the report of the Joint Interstate Commerce Commission and Indiana Public Service Commission following an investigation. Alonzo Sargent, the train driver, who was under arrest, refused to testify to any of the hearings on advice of his counsel. What he did say, I've already included in the retelling earlier in this film, the details of his sleepless 24 hours, the heavy meals, how he responded after being startled awake, all of that is according to his own words in a report to the officials of the railroad company. It is worth noting that he also said in his statement, quote, We struck almost instantly after making the brake application. 
Don't know whether I closed the throttle or not, but think I did. Looked to see where the fireman was and saw he was running toward the gangway. Did not see a fusee, hear a torpedo, or see any other warning signal up to the time I saw the red tail lights. We interrupt this quote to explain that a fusee is like a flare that brakemen have access to and typically put out to draw attention to the stop state of a train, especially in an emergency. They're very, very bright and easy to spot. A torpedo is a coin-sized device that is used as a loud warning signal to train drivers. You place it on top of the rail and secure it with two lead straps, one on each side. When the wheel of the train passes over, it explodes, emitting a loud bang. Again, it's typically used to alert other train drivers of a stop train ahead, especially in poor conditions like a dense fog. They are detonated by pressure rather than impact, making them safe during transport. Sergeant goes on to report, quote, Wreck happened at about 4.05 a.m., June 22nd, and I stayed there for an hour or more, assisting in getting people out of the wreckage. I have been in the service of the Michigan Central Railroad Company for approximately 28 or 29 years, the last 16 of which I have been continuously employed as an engineer. I am in perfect physical condition, as well as mental condition, and have had no illness within 25 or 30 years requiring the service of a doctor. There was nothing defective about the air brakes or other mechanism of the engine or train that I was operating, nor was there any defective condition of any of the signals or track upon which I was operating to the best of my knowledge. The accident was due solely to the fact that I accidentally fell asleep and I had no intent to injure any person, nor was same done with malice, but solely through an accident, as Afro said. This brings me to mind of the relatively recent scandals with airline pilots not getting enough sleep, which really brought to light the dangers of sleep deprivation and its effects on concentration, the occurrence of microsleeps, and other related mal-effects. Of course, this also highlighted other professional occupations, especially public transport vehicles like bus drivers, truck drivers, train drivers, and regulations were put in place and or more strictly enforced for minimum sleep hours in a particular time period. This, of course, has made all transportation options a lot safer with fewer accidents due to tiredness. The ICC report concluded, quote, This accident was caused by the engine man sergeant being asleep and from this cause failing to observe the stop indication of automatic signal 2581 and the warnings of the flagman of the circus train and to be governed by them. The report was also critical of the older wooden cars whose oil lamps ignited the fire immediately after the collision. Sergeant and his fireman Gustav Klaus were charged with manslaughter in Lake County, Indiana, but following the trial the jury was deadlocked and a mistrial was declared. Prosecutors declined to retry the case, and charges were dismissed on June 9, 1920. I was unable to find the ICC report anywhere online, which is unfortunate because I wanted to check what the mitigating circumstances might be for why Sargent was not found culpable for the accident. Was he forced to work those long hours without breaks? Was that why the jury thought it wasn't his fault? Aftermath The train wreck occurred on a Saturday, and its effects caused the Hagenbach Wallace Circus's show in Hammond and another in Monroe, Wisconsin on June 24th to be cancelled. However, almost unbelievably, the circus reconfigured but with many of the same performers who just three days earlier had lived through the crash resumed business as usual. They performed on June 25th in Belois, Wisconsin, with other circuses providing some of the acts to make up for those who had perished in the awful accident. The show went on. This is a staple philosophy with circus folk. It is considered highly unlucky to miss a performance, as we will also see in the Hartford Circus Fire documentary, which is coming up next on this channel. Circus performers and workers are resolute in making the show go on, despite accident or tragedy. They just go to work. It's a very admirable quality. A correspondent for the Indianapolis News summed it up nicely. Quote, Forced mirth under the big top was courage and necessity. One's work is one's work. If it happens that this work is to make the kitties laugh and clap, why one must make the kitties laugh and clap. Big Joe Coyle, the clown whose family died before his eyes, did not make the trip to Wisconsin. But his life went on. 
1922, he managed a vaudeville show called George White's Scandals, a show where the Three Stooges got their start. Later, Coyle returned to clowning in the Chicago area under the name Coco the Clown. He worked as a clown into the mid-1950s at children's parties and retail stores and died in 1960. Injuries and Showman's Rest The Hammond Circus train wreck was one of the worst train wrecks in U.S. history. 86 people were crushed or burned to death in the wreck. 127 were injured with lacerations, crush injuries, broken bones, amputations, and of course, horrific burns. Strongmen, bareback riders, trapeze performers, and acrobats were killed instantly, and others were horribly maimed as the wooden circus cars telescoped into one another through the force of Sargent's train. The subsequent fire was so intense that many of the victims were assumed to be some of the African-American porters on the train. Further investigations revealed that their skin was not black through genetics. It had been severely burned. Among the dead were Arthur Dierks and Max Neatsborn of the Great Dierks Brothers, a strongman act, and Jenny Ward Todd of the Flying Wards. John B. Warren was the president of the Showman's League of America, a fraternal organization for circus and carnival workers founded in Chicago in 1913. Months before the crash, it was his idea to have the SLA purchase the cemetery plot that came to be known as Showman's Rest. Little did he know it would be used so soon and for so many of his comrades to have to be buried at the same time. His feeling in starting the cemetery is that no showman should have to go to a pauper's grave, that circus folk take care of their own. As a side note, both men and women go by the term showman. It's part of circus culture even today. Showman's rest was designated as the site for those who died in the train wreck to be buried. The grave site is unusual in that it is a mass grave containing the remains of 56 of the crash victims, each in their own coffin, but buried in one large hole. They excavated an area of 35 by 24 feet and 5 feet deep. That's 11 by 7 meters and almost 1.5 meters deep. Each of the 56 has a headstone. Remember that in 1918, there was no DNA testing or even social security cards, which would help identify people. There was a time when people, young and old, literally ran off to join the circus, and their real names might never have been known. Some of the dead were roustabouts or temporary workers hired only hours or days earlier. The grave would house both the unidentified and unidentifiable, those burnt so badly that their features couldn't even be made out. Almost all the headstones are marked either unknown male or unknown female. But there are a couple of outliers. In two cases, it appears that at least their nicknames were known. One headstone says Baldy and another says Smiley. Another headstone says Four Horse Driver suggesting that the survivor didn't know the person's name, but at least knew their job. Five days after the accident, three clergymen officiated at the funeral, a Catholic priest, a Baptist minister, and the Reverend Colonel F.J. Owens, a chaplain for the Showman's League of America. There were 1,500 mourners at the funeral, including Big Joe Coyle, the clown who had painfully watched his family die. It didn't take long for another showman to join the train wreck's victims, John B. Warren, the Showman's League president, died a week after he attended the funerals and internment of those who were killed in the train wreck. He was buried alongside them. I did a search for him, but the internet didn't give me any information. Did he die of grief? Like a heart attack? Or was it just his time? It's a sad story in any case. In the world of the circus, elephants are very symbolic. An upraised trunk denotes joy while the lowered trunk symbolizes mourning. At Showman's Rest, five granite elephant statues keep watch over the mass grave of circus performers. Each elephant has a foot raised with the ball underneath, and every one of their trunks hangs low. The largest of the five bears the inscription, Showman's League of America. On the other four are inscribed the words, Showman's Rest. The victims of the train wreck were the first to be interred in the new section of Woodlawn Cemetery. This awful tragedy killed trapeze artists, bareback riders, a lion tamer, a strongman, a clown's entire family, among dozens of others. 
such a shame to lose such talented and hardworking people in an accident that could easily have been avoided. Such a senseless loss of life. 100 years later, on the 22nd of June, 2018, a new marker was erected by the Circus Historical Society commemorating the tragedy and honoring the victims. What would you do? I have two main questions for you to answer today, and the first is a lot darker than the second. First question. There was no way to effectively move the heavy beams and rubble that trapped most of the victims. People were begging to be shot rather than suffer the excruciating pain of being burned alive. If you were there, would you and could you shoot them? Second question. What mitigating circumstances do you believe would be adequate to find Alonzo Sargent not guilty of the crime of falling asleep at the throttle? Let me know in the comments. Really looking forward to seeing if you can find reason to excuse his lapse in judgment. That's the end of our history today. If you got something out of today's episode, please subscribe to the channel, click the bell, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you enjoyed this video, please activate the like button and consider leaving a comment. Both help us grow the channel so we can offer you more histories in this format. If you want to get in touch with me, write to me at the email on the about page or ping me on Discord. And remember to subscribe to our social media channels on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. If you're consuming this episode as a podcast, we'd be very thankful if you left a review since that raises our ratings on the podcast sites and helps people find us. As always, much love to our patrons.